Balance, for as long as I have been enjoying games, there has been a few constants in the sort of genres that I enjoy, and those typically have been, for one, strategy games, ranging the gambit from Command and Conquer to Civilization. Then after that we got role-playing games such as Knights of the Old Republic or even Elder Scrolls. And then of course there are shooters, whether it be the third-person variety like Max Payne or first-person shooters like Halo or Half-Life. There's always something so wonderfully visceral and immersive with first-person shooters that always has me coming back. For instance, in games like Deus Ex, I love scrounging around every nook and cranny looking for secret passages, or in the Metro games, it's always so invigorating when you have to go to the surface and put on the gas mask, knowing that this simple model and filter over your head with a rinky-dink piece of glass is the only thing between life and desiccating death. But another genre that I've sank my tenorous teeth into, especially in the last decade, is the realm of horror games. That if you have seen the output of most of my videos, it seems to have become a verifiable addiction. And just like its friends in the shooter, RPG, and strategy genres, I pretty much enjoy all walks of unlife in the genre, like the great survival horrors of Resident Evil or Silent Hill, to even more unorthodox games like Danganronpa, which is of course a visual novel that shows its horrific head when you are tasked with investigating the murders of high school kids and then eventually choosing to kill one of them as a culprit in the class trials. Though there is one elusive subgenre of horror that doesn't seem to pop out as often and that is of course first person shooter horror games. But you might be thinking to yourself, hey Tom, there's tons of FPS games out there with horror elements. And while that is true in that a lot of FPS have some horror elements in them or even some spooky levels, there really aren't that many shooters that seamlessly meld both games together. Which finally brings us to the game that we're going to be retrospecting today and that is of course Fear, a wonderfully spooky first person shooter developed by Monolith Productions. Before we get too deep into fear, I think we should go in a little into Monolith Productions because their history and the sort of titles that they have released over the years are honestly pretty damn wild. Because they've done stuff from boomer shooters, a mecha anime inspired mech combat FPS, a 60s inspired spy espionage game, a friggin Lord of the Rings MOBA, and now they're working on a Wonder Woman game. A great place to start and honestly a game that is neck and neck for me as one of my favorite monolith games and that is of course the classic dynamite throwing blood. The boomer shooter classic that came out all the way back in 1997 which stars the moody Caleb on his quest to defeat these raggedy ass cultists by burning them to death or throwing comically lit sticks of dynamite at him. After that in 1999, Monolith takes a turn for the horrific in a manner that nobody expects with Shogo Mobile Armor Division where they mix up the regular FPS gameplay of the era with first person mech combat with a very odd critical hit system that had you destroying mechs as easily as they would destroy you. But the game had a very distinctive anime or as they would call it back in the day, a very Japanimation inspired look that just didn't cut it for what it was trying to convey and honestly came out a little bit terrifying. Though it makes you think what they could do with the engines today that really give out that anime look because I think a mobile armor game like that would be awesome today. Moving forward into the 2000s we have the spy thriller release of No One Lives Forever which is an espionage FPS set in the 1960s that takes a lot of inspiration from spy films of the era like James Bond but with a bit more tongue in cheek action, well if you know what I mean. No One Lives Forever starred Kate Archer, a Unity agent that's tasked with finding an assassin that has murdered most of her colleagues in a bid for an unknown party to take over the world. So she has to go world hopping with her selection of fine firearms and cool gadgets to get to the bottom of things. Well, you know, if you know what I mean. Like Blood and unlike Shogo, this is another great game from Monolith that showed that they can hop from different settings within the FPS genre and really create a substantial FPS that back in 2000 actually won a lot of the Game of the Year awards and would eventually get a sequel in 2002. From here there's a stretch from 2005 all the way to 2009 for which I would like to call the horror years where Monolith released such greats as today's game Fear and then after that the incredible condemned Criminal Origin which I will absolutely be doing a retrospective video one of these days, its sequel Condemned to Bloodshot, and finally culminating with the sequel to Fear known as Fear 2 Project Origin that released in 2009, ending this little era. 
After this little era of spookies, Monolith now completely subsumed into the Warner Brothers game mill, released a few games in the Middle Earth setting. The most famous of which are 2014's Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, and 2017's Shadow of War, with the strangest being Guardians of Middle Earth, which was a Lord of the Rings based MOBA that barely anyone remembers. Now I don't have much to say about these games because to be honest, while they're decent games that never really caught my eye and attention and hold that juvenile thought in my mind of, well, Monolith could have made more horror shooters but instead they made a Lord of the Rings Arkham ripoff, which I will inevitably piss off my co-host Andrew since I know he loves those games. And to cap off this section regarding Monolith Productions history, we have to take a look to the future and all we know is that since 2017, they've been hard at work making a Wonder Woman game since pretty much every single studio owned by Warner Brothers is now focused on making something supplementary to James Gunn's new DC Sloppyverse. Man oh man, Monolith Productions out there have been doing some awesome stuff, from some of the coolest boomer shooters just to some exquisite horror FPSs to even a quick little fling with Middle Earth, and now they're doing a Wonder Woman game, so they're kind of all over the place. I'm kind of sad that they're delayed, you know, like to horror-ish, but whatever, we'll have to deal with that eventually. But you might be wondering to yourself, hey, can I play this game right out of the box? And the answer is, mmm, kinda. Fellas, you can certainly play Fear right out of the box, or I guess you should say these days from a fresh install, but there's going to be quite a few quality of life improvements that you're going to want to do beforehand that will make your experience an even better one on modern hardware, and it should only take maybe about 20 minutes of messing around. I'll link below a wonderful guide by the Power Armor 76 that will guide you through the process of fixing the resolution setting proper FOV, being able to properly play the game at 60 frames per second, and of course getting EAX sound to work without having a ye old ass sound card installed. Only issue that I came across that unfortunately I found no fix for at this point in writing is that there are issues with the sounds of some of the guns, particularly the submachine gun and the assault rifle which sound rather soft compared to the other guns. I have no clue what causes it, but I'm gonna have to chop this one up to the glitch gremlins and raise my little white flag in defeat. Surely there's probably some mods out there that fix this, but I didn't go that far with it because I want to have as much of a vanilla experience as possible. And on top of that, you kind of eventually do get used to the sounds being rather soft, and it's just normal. Another issue that I came across is with the expansions extraction point in Perseus Mandate that I had trouble playing them at a 21 by 9 aspect ratio, which is typically where I play my games at. To fix this, I basically just had to also raise my white flag in defeat in that point and play the game at 16 by 9 which is the aspect ratio that most of you will be playing at to begin with, so don't worry about that one too much. Alternatively, of course, if you found a copy of Fear for the Xbox 360s, then there's some good news to know that it's part of their backwards compatibility program, so if you have a Series X, then pop that sucker in and enjoy the game. Just don't use the FPS boost because it does some weird shish to the gameplay and it's not patched like it is on PC. So with all of the kegate out of the way, then we can finally get into and see what Fear is all about. In the not too distant future, next 2025 AD, Man, nobody's gonna get that damn reference, but whatever. In 2025 AD, there's a fictional military unit of the United States known as FEAR, or the First Encounter Assault Recon, which was established in 2002 in order to combat the emergent threat of supernatural phenomena that could cause havoc to the United States. So I'm guessing in this case, the song would go something a little like, if there's something strange in your neighborhood, who are you gonna call the First Encounter Assault Recon? You play the role of Point Man, a new member to Fear that is sent to the city of Fairport to deal with Paxton Fettel, a cannibalistic psychic operative initiated by the Armicam Technology Corporation who psychically leads a new legion of cloned super soldiers named Replicas, and has recently gone rogue and it is up to the Point Man and the rest of the First Encounter Assault Recon team to take him down. Now, we could go through a never-ending legion of psychically controlled cloned soldiers to eventually bring things under control, but we end up finding out that Fettel is the head of the snake, so to speak, so if fear takes him down, the rest of the replicas will shut down as well. But I don't know about you fellas, but some weird shit must be going on because you keep hallucinating a red clan girl in a couple of times, and after an unlikely encounter with Fettel, he hits us with some knowledge.
You will be a god among men. So we got ourselves a American military unit that combats the supernatural, a psychic cannibal that has gone rogue from a pharmaceuticals and aerospace company that actually makes like cryogenic technologies and a bunch of other weird paramilitary stuff, followed by clone soldiers that have also gone rogue because the psychic cannibal is psychically leading them. Yeah, it's kind of a weird bunch. And certainly there's a lot more to this story to be told, but as far as we need to know right now is that there are bad guys to shoot and we're going to have to shoot them. So with that, let's get into some presentation. Typically, fellas, I replay Fear every other year or so, but this last stretch has gone on for about five years since the last time I played. But with that being said, as time goes on, the more and more Fear tends to hold up well in my opinion. This is, in my opinion, chalked up to the very simple but excellent lighting and a soundscape ranging from eerie soundtracks to the shower of bullets that hail the oncoming doom of replica soldiers that ultimately keep me thinking that there's things fear does that I wish they still did today. To start off, I would like to talk about the visuals of fear and how even with simple graphics to today's standards, you can actually get a lot done with some really clever static lighting mixed with the occasional dynamic light to spice some things up really well. Environments are lit in such a fashion that you would expect of the locales that you'd visit, whether it be the dingy concrete interiors of the Fairport Water Treatment Plant in Auburn, or the computer lit offices and hallways of Armacam HQ that have you wondering whether that thing you saw was a replica soldier moving through the darkness, or just the flickering of office CRT monitors. In this case, fellas, static lighting means that the lighting you see in the map comes from a static or non-dynamic sources, so no matter what, it's always going to be lit in the same manner, and this is found throughout most of the game. What Fear does really well is having a small but significant amount of dynamic lighting to really make that difference that works hand in hand with all the gameplay styles like throwing your grenade into a stuffed office room and having the lights turn off or fling around once it blows up, or turning a corner and seeing the lit shadow of a replica soldier and wondering if he's right around the corner or casting it from down further in the hallway. It doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when the lighting systems are working in conjunction with each other, it creates a really dense and moody atmosphere that is doing its best to both keep you on your toes and revel in the onslaught that you're going to put these replica soldiers through when you enter the next room. Though ultimately always making you wonder if you're going to be spooked or cooked in the next room. So now that we got the presentation of fear out of the way, we should probably talk about the soundscape of fear because it's got two interesting things. One, the soundtrack that's spooky as hell, and then the diegetic sounds that are also just as spooky as hell, but also cool in another way. So either way, it makes you want to load another round, whether that be into your pistol or into your diapy. Now I'll quickly touch on the soundtrack for Fear because honestly it's the simplest element of the soundscape and honestly kind of a mix of what you would expect a horror game to have in that era. It has your horror strings when something spooky happens or more ambient horror droning that has you dreading what might be lurking in the shadows. The horror strings in particular I find to be comical at times, not just for the fact that at this point in Anno Domini 2024 that they are a little cliche, but because half of the time if you weren't paying attention that the spook would zoom on and be leaving you wondering what the horror strings were for, perhaps an office chair jump scare. At other times the soundtrack kicks in in a lot of the firefights that will have you shooting replica baddies to what I can only describe as 2000s shooty man music, because I honestly don't remember much of it at all. It's just stuff that I would describe from that era, but if I am being honest, it just gets the job done when the action kicks in. Now one aspect of the soundtrack that I generally enjoyed is the sort of horror droning that I honestly think is typical of the era as well. Reminding me of similar soundtracks that fill me with dread like Stalker that has these long droning sounds that just drown the world in this sense of dread that to me signify that things are just wrong. An aspect that Monolith were particularly good at, especially during the stretch of horror games, is creating a world and atmosphere that you can tell is in serious decline. It doesn't matter if it be the waste management site, or the Armacam HQ, it feels like the world is slowly falling apart with the situation getting worse and worse. 
In this aspect, they don't really go over what else FEAR as an organization has done, but it's telling to me that the military has made this unit to combat supernatural phenomenon to begin with that alludes that things might have gotten bad at some time, and it seems that the regular military treats them as a joke. Even starting the mission to grab Fettel, Fear has no damn clue on what's going on in the grand scheme and are there to clean up the situation in a clandestine manner. So having that information in hand, it really did something for me when you see these dingy, dilapidated treatment sites and offices with the voice messages wondering just what in the hell is going on. And it probably doesn't help when you get to the occasional hallucination showing something extremely horrible that it probably doesn't help in making this crap sack world any more pleasant to be in. Another monolith game that actually gives me this feeling really really well is Condemned Criminal Origins that has this feeling of like a collapsing society and just how so real and visceral that it is that it just kind of man gives me the creeps. But with that we should probably go into the gun toting gameplay of of fear because man oh man we've been talking about this lighting and the sound now we gotta shoot some stuff so let's get into it the magic of fear's gunplay comes from a couple of great decisions that allow seemingly dynamic scenarios to occur that frequently have you on your toes while in a firefight and when you reciprocate to allow the onslaught to be glorious the main gameplay mechanic of fear that sets us apart from a lot of other FPS games of the period is genuinely great slow motion mechanic that has you slowing down time to get some shots off at replica soldiers and if you do well watch them get churned into meat butter. Whether it be the simple visuals of dual pistols slinging bullets away or the cathartic thunk of the penetrator nail weapon, nailing replica soldiers to the wall all the while they're doing their slow down little screams of pain. And there's another thing that Fear does that's an interesting choice that newer shooters would forego because it's too old school. And what I mean by that is that shooters of the period didn't really have aim down sights yet, so when you aim down any of your weapons except a force with anything with a scope, it would just zoom in on the camera a little, but in general you could still see what's going on. We would typically think of this as an archaic form of design, and for the most part and to modern sensibilities it is, but it has the added benefit that all the action and carnage that is occurring can be seen in full view, without a slew of sight pictures, scopes, and red dot sights obscuring the full consequences of what you have wrought to these clone soldiers. There are times when you hit the slow-mo and you go into a trance of downing each and every one of their targets. You start with mowing down the first soldier to get through the door, his body going limp, and before he even hits the floor, you're on to his companion, who you hit with a point-blank shotgun blast, turning him into a pile of viscera, his head bursting like a rotten grapefruit. You hit the slow-mo button once more to get out of it and like a VCR being fast forwarded to get to the proper time, a quick inversion of all the sounds that you have wrought catches up to you and all the bodies hit the floor as well as the cases from every single bullet you fired. And I really do gotta say fellas how much I really dig the sound design and fear. Because when you turn on EAX and have all the bells and whistles working, it really creates an immersive soundscape that honestly feels like a lot of it has been lost to time, comparatively speaking. For the most part, the weapons have a nice punchy sound to them that equalizes with the visual spectacles of muzzle flaring, the slow down screaming of replica soldiers matching perfectly as their body ragdolls to the floor. And all the meanwhile there's faint whispers in your ears that have you wondering if what you heard was just the last gasp of a dying soldier or something more malevolent. Out of all the sounds that fear has to offer there are two that left me kind of baffled and it's honestly kind of a bug at this point but it has to do with the sound of the SMG and the assault rifle that should be loud and punchy but instead come off as rather soft making you think that it probably has a suppressor on it only to find out that these guns have already been circumcised. 
You only really find it with these two weapons, and the rest of them sound just fine, so it must be a problem with the way that alchemy works in order to get EAX working without a sun card. At the very least, some of my other favorite sounds coming from the replica soldiers I heard loud and clear. Which means now is a good time to talk about one of the aspects of fear that people have been talking about since time immemorial, really since the game came out, and that is of course the AI to fear, which has some really cool magic tricks that set it apart from the rest. For the fellas out there that aren't aware, which I wouldn't hold it against you since I haven't heard this discourse in a while, but Fear has been known to have some of the best enemy combat AI that you can find in games, and while for the most part there is a lot of greatness to be found, some of the magic show is really just smoke and mirrors. Though there are some general uses of the AI that are pretty clever, such as the replica's ability to change around the environment by dropping shelves, moving out of cover rapidly, and generally actually trying to flank you, most of what the game is known for is actually a great magic trick. Turns out that having an enemy that vocalizes a lot of their actions make it seem like they're constantly responding to different stimuli and trying to adapt. It might not be the wisest move for a replica to engage you down a hallway, but the fact that he'll radio, I'm gonna flank him, and actually attempt to flank me goes a long way. There's many other great examples as well, such as if a replica is the last on his squad, he'll take notice of it and radio in reinforcements. And while them saying that didn't actually bring in more goons to the fight, the next time you fight the next squad, it feels like the reinforcements actually came in to kick your ass. And of course, it goes on and on with the callouts ranging from them saying they're going to throw a grenade and actually doing so, and generally just doing interesting actions that you don't see in a lot of games these days, like actually retreating out of the way or moving to a new position and shooting at you while they're doing it. It really isn't a whole lot, but the dynamicism of the actions that the replica soldiers can do are typically attributed to the fact that through a significant chunk of the game, you are in the offices of the Armacam headquarters, where they will shuffle desk, pull down shelves as makeshift cover, and coordinate their action cubicle per cubicle. But it's through this dynamicism and a bit of aggression that makes the replica soldiers so interesting to fight. They're not the smartest of the smartest of AI out there, but the fact that they're choreographing everything they do like a squad, and probably because this is a horror game always popping out of places when you least expect it, it feels like they always have the drop on you, in a great way. Like sure, they're really popping out of monster closets and doors and hallways that after the fight that's the way that you're going to have to go to continue, but the fights are paced out in such a way that when you finish one squad, there's another one arriving just to greet you and you're going through these fights always on the back foot and certainly feeling like you just got on by the skin of your teeth. It's funny how I mentioned that the individual fights are paced out pretty well, because a common criticism of fear is that a lot of people have, and I kind of sort of share with, is that the overall pacing of the experience is a little lopsided. You'll see when I get to spoilers, but the vast majority of this game takes place within the Armacam headquarter offices. So, for most of the game, you'll be seeing very similar office settings of cubicles, hallways, and elevator hubs that for some go on and on and on and on without end. Personally, I don't think it's as bad as a lot of other people claim, but I will say that there comes a point where I basically have had enough of the endless Armacam offices, and for me, that feeling comes right when you are done at Armacam HQ and move on to the final area of the game that is a nice short change from where you have been because it caps off the game for you. The offices to me are fine because it has this really interesting mundaneness to the whole thing for me that is almost how I feel like it would be in reality. When you trek along in the Armacam HQ, snooping at every hackable laptop or listening to every voicemail, it creates this picture that these wild technologies that can really ruin things when put in the wrong hands aren't just made in the most average of looking places but are also made by people like you or me. When you start to figure out what just in the hell is going on with all these cannibals and clone soldiers, then you start to figure out that the scope of the threat is a lot larger than you can expect. It really hits home just how messed up this world is that I wish they could work more with that. But sadly, the scope of the trilogy of games doesn't really expand as much as I would have wanted to. 
But to double back to the issues of fear, some people might not enjoy the large chunk of the game that takes place at Armicam and might not care about the narrative as much as I would, so they might get bored relatively quickly after an hour or so in the offices. As well another issue that can be seen with the AI is that if you take them out of the offices and into more static areas then the AI just simply doesn't have as much stuff to do, so it isn't as interesting or as dynamic as they are at Armicam. It's probably why near the end of the game they send some other types of enemies for you to fight that change things up relatively, that way you're not just fighting the same elite replica soldiers through the entire final stretch. And if I had to add another nitpick is that there's a section where instead of replica forces you'll be fighting some ATC Armacamp Technology Corporation security which is the internal security arm of Armicam, and to be brutally honest, they just don't have the charm and threat to them that the Republic of Forces do. It's certainly not easy trying to make a mall cop with guns look threatening when you come across forces that use a friggin' nail gun to nail your nuts to the wall. It doesn't last for a long time and you'll quickly go back to fighting the regular replica forces, but even though there's a narrative reason for it, it still come across as rather weak and not something that I would personally do if I was the head of a large aerospace and pharmaceutical company. Another issue that is honestly a showcase of the era that Fear came out is that the levels are also known as intervals, or rather short, not necessarily in length but in how often it makes you stop the game and load into another area, usually by dropping down into a hole which if this was a modern game, chunks of this game would be hidden by elevator rides or just loading in when the game started. So I think we pretty much wrapped up all I gotta say about the gameplay and the presentation of Fear. The last thing that I gotta talk about is going through the plot of Fear and so if you don't want to get spoiled in this game and you want to go into it blind then you can skip ahead by going to this timestamp here. Alrighty, everybody gone? Okay, let's talk about the plot to Fear. It's made immediately clear that there's some sort of bad shit going on because of all the big players that are seemingly connected to each other. There is of course Fettel and his replica soldiers that are on the hunt to something and something that we just don't quite know yet. There's also Armorcam Technology Corporation that's both trying to assist Fear in stopping Fennel, but not so much as to let everyone know the truth of what's going on, and of course, poor old Point Man at the center of it all, getting more and more uncomfortable as he starts to understand why Fettel has taken such an interest in him. The game starts off in the suburbs of Fairport where you are tasked with finding Fettel and bringing him down but as the chase moves along the water treatment plant, you start to figure out that things aren't as they seem in the sense that it's clear that Fettel and his forces are on the lookout for something or someone. The fear team then gets split into two squads of SEFOD Delta soldiers where the veteran Jankowski is leading one one way and you are leading another squad in another way in the hopes of getting Fettel by a pincer maneuver of sorts. But that pretty much all gets immediately thrown out the window when your squad comes to an untimely and honestly rather horrific demise. So we're starting to get a bunch of questions such as what in the goddamn can melt my fellow soldiers and is this something that Fettel can do or is this the work of something even more malevolent and then of course so on and so forth. There's also rising questions about the company that Fear is sent to clean up for because Armicam has some rather curious interests on what's going on down by the waterfront, what with having employees that are spies for the company and heavily monitoring the surrounding area, which gives credence to Fettel searching the area for something else. Eventually we're met with the replica forces and as stated earlier, these guys are no joke, wiping out the ATC security and the poor goons that work at the waterfront with ease due to not just their advanced physiology but being coordinated by Fettel as the puppet master in the process. As Point Man goes through more and more of the replica forces, we come across a series of targets that look to have been cannibalized. And these poor souls that while seemingly are just guys down at the waterfront are actually connected to this whole shit show in one way or another. As soon as it seems that you have what you are looking for, Fettel bounces from the treatment plant and Jankowski goes missing. 
with the only thing left behind is his biometrics tracker and his squad of liquefacted Delta Force soldiers. Sadly, there's no time to figure out just what in the hell happened to Jankowski since Fear has been notified that Federal and the Replica forces are storming Armacam HQ and we have to follow the trail of goop and bodies to stop Fettel. Of course, the closer and closer we get to Fettel, the more and more questions that we have, and there's barely any answers, but thankfully, we might have some answers going into Armacam HQ. Point Man is then offloaded into the helipad of Armacam HQ, and in typical fashion, as shown with your goons, they are gunned down nearly immediately. Almost as if the game doesn't really know what to do with the friendly AI, so they just kinda, you know, write him out of the game or something. From here on out, as Point Man clears floors and floors at the HQ offices, and cubicle by cubicle, he's starting to learn from hacking into laptops and listening in on voicemails that it's very clear that this event was somehow foreseen and that nobody did anything to stop it, with theories being thrown around as to why that could be. Perhaps it's because Armacam wants to keep things on the down low and hush hush to not lose any government contracts, with with their star psychic pupil going rogue and all. Or perhaps even it was sabotage from the inside in a bid for someone to right some wrongs that they have committed in the past. Or even perhaps it could be that this was planned all along as some sort of in-depth trial run for the replicas and the concept of the psychic commander. The plot thickens when we start to learn of the various different clandestine projects that Armacam has going on, running the gambits of trying to stop bone decay of subjects in the near-Earth orbit, or running a school for prize pupils that while testing for psychic abilities, they're also slipping in pills to improve their mathematics. And of course, as seen throughout the offices, there are applications for R&D relating to military-like advanced fighter jets, satellites, and increasingly badass weaponry. The star project at Armacam, though, seems to be Project Perseus, a project with objectives to produce a psychic commander and see if it is possible for it to lead psychically linked clone soldiers, which by the amount of grief that the replica forces are giving you seems to have turned out just dandy. And there is, of course, the elusive Project Origin. Well, to ruin the suspense, I should probably mention that while we're all learning this, there's a fat Newman-ass guy running around the place, asking for help before then slamming the door in your face every time. Almost like he's got his own mission to be on. This would also be a good time to start and introduce some of the other stars of the game, such as Aldous Bishop, which is one of the employees at Armicam that we find in the midst of a siege of the headquarters taken hostage by the replica forces, and booby trapped with explosives. We don't really get to know much about him before he gets murked by Armicam security in order to cover something up. What we do know is that Bishop was researching the Auburn and Waterfront districts in an effort to figure out any changes that have been going on over the last 20 years. Stuff like the changes in the chemicals in the water and apparently something more, hmm, psychic. We know he was also doing this with another Army Cam employee known as Alice Wade, who is the daughter of head researcher Harlan Wade, which is what seems to be Fettel's prime objective at Army Cam HQ. For what purpose we don't really know, since all we know about Harlan Wade is that he was the head of Project Origin some odd 20 years ago, and that Fettel somehow was a product of it. It becomes clear that Fettel is hunting down anyone that has any connections to Wade or Project Origin, but at this point we really don't have a clue why. It could be a form of late stage revenge for what they have done to him, or perhaps he's looking for something more insidious. All the while we have Norton Mapes, our lovable cheese poos munching fatso trying to stop you all along the way for reasons that aren't quite clear, since he still has access to Armacam HQ's security network and is actively being hunted down by replica forces and protected by Armacam security for another undisclosed reason, but this just means that there's probably like a fifth or sixth party in this whole mess at play here. So we got the fear unit that's trying to stop Fettel and not cause any more damage from him and his replica forces. Then on the other hand, we got Armacam trying to stop us as well as Fettel because they don't want any of the bad stuff that they've been doing to come out onto the public sense. And then of course there is Fettel who, the more and more we get into the game, the closer and closer he gets to Harlan Wade and what he's really been seeking this whole time. And then somehow right in the middle of all of this is Point Man somehow connected to all of it. So with that, we should probably start going into the elusive Project Origin. And you know that kind of, that little girl that's been running around through the hallucinations and trash? 
you know that one that's right behind me right there yeah that's project origin Fellas, now we're introducing Alma Wade, the little girl that you've seen throughout the game and through a series of different hallucinations generally trying to spook you, and in some other sections using her psychic abilities to try and fry your ass, but for whatever reason we don't really know why. Just know that every so often, when we find those corpses that have gone through complete liquefaction, that is the work of Alma. Which sort of leads me to believe that she might also be a developer over at Monolith since she is directly preventing us from seeing AI versus AI battles occur. Alma, as far as the world of fear is concerned, is quite possibly the most powerful psionic force that has been developed in humanity. And after nasty communications issues during the war in Vietnam, the US government has tasked Armacam with creating psychic commanders in order to alleviate all of these issues. Because of her psychic abilities, Alma was a handful to deal with, to the point that she would induce terrible nightmares and mental maladies to the Armacam researchers trying to take her DNA samples and replicate her psychic abilities and other subjects. Armacam, under the direction of Harlan Wade, transferred Alma to a secret facility where she could be tested on easily due to the psychic dampening and sedation and not to mention to perform even more nefarious experiments on her. It was also eventually decided that to create soldiers of the same caliber and abilities as Alma that it wasn't just enough to splice her genes into other subjects, but to actually have Alma impregnated with the subjects to create an even greater psychic connection. Hence, Project Origin was born, no pun intended. Though going through long and rigorous processes to get new subjects didn't produce the results that Armacam wanted right away, so it was just kind of decided that the whole science team would just pump their own batter into Alma to produce subjects from their own and Alma's DNA. Harlan Wade, aka Alma's father, being included in this nonsense. But I gotta say fellas that Armacam really redefined the notion of pumping and dumping with this one because with the alleged huge docket of scientists, it only really produced a couple of successful subjects that we're known of. One of which is our good old boy Paxton Fennel and the other one is still undisclosed so I guess we're gonna have to find that one out a little bit later. So at this point, we know that in the end, Fettel's goal has been a wholesome family reunion this whole time, which really explains a lot. Though for some reason, it still doesn't explain the cannibalism, so let's just chalk that one up to mommy issues. Now that we're all caught up, there's only one thing left to do, and that is to follow Fettel over all the way back to Auburn and the Waterfront District to have a final showdown with the Master of Muppets. So Fettel is the son of a psychic witch with daddy issues. If you can call, like, inseminating your own daughter with your own sperm, daddy issues, which in turn has caused Fettel to have mommy issues and become a psychic cannibal. And then through all of that, he's trying to come back and have a nice big happy reunion, which makes you damn. Is there anything more to this game to reveal? Well, I guess we'll see. We head down to Auburn, which is where the location of the vault, and no, I'm not talking about the ones where assholes in blue jumpsuits pop out of. We're talking instead about a vault used to contain Alma's psychic essence, even though we figured out that she died nearly a decade ago, but some say that hate came in an epoch before time itself. In the vault, which is also the Armicam black site for Project Origin, the whole cast of characters has come down for one final reunion and for them all to meet their individual conclusions. After a short sequence of firefights through the Origin facility, we find that the daughter and sister to Alma Wade, Alice, has been found by Fettel and like everyone else he has come across, she's been cannibalized with the vengeful specter of Alma watching while Fettel consumes her. And not too long after that, we put a bullet in that son of a bitch's head, stopping his schemes and shutting down the replica forces in the process. With an eerily quiet origin facility around us, we finally reach the innermost chamber overlooking the vault where Alma is stored, and after some choice words, Harlan completes the cycle and has the reunion that Fettel has been looking for.
From here on out, Fella's shit quickly hits the psychic fan with literal nightmares manifesting into reality as we fight our way out of the origin facility and narrowly dodge those baddies and all the other goons being thrown our way. And we finally make it back to the fear helicopter and get our asses out of there to live to fight for another day. And there you have it, fellas. That was Fear or First Encounter Assault Recon, which was an absolute blast to play through, especially since I haven't played it in a few years. And it made me realize, you know, like, man, there's some things that it still holds up and still does incredibly well. And there's some other things that, you know, have kind of come through the cracks. But it's like, you know what? And all, it was a blast to play through. Fear is honestly one of those games, fellas, that it feels absolutely great to replay every so often around the halloween -y season because it seamlessly mixes my love for all things horror and the innermost self that just wants to rip and tear these replica baddies a whole new clonussy. Though I really gotta say that being a force of clone soldiers, psychically forced to fight your way through an entire military and aerospace company's forces, and on top of that an FPS protagonist might take the cake for an abusive and manipulative relationship in this game. So cheers to the replica baddies. I hope to have many, many more years of hearing you scream your lungs out over in slow-mo. Moving on, the game isn't as scary as I used to think it was, but that is not to say that in the footage that I have recorded that replica forces spooked the hell out of me a couple of times, because you can actually see me flinch quite a bit, which to me is a great sign that it still spooks me every so often. A lot of the scripted horror of trying to jump scare you with some guy or little girl walking across your vision like a drunk driver heading home after a good night on the town doesn't really faze me at all. But like with the drunk driver, having the boys in blue knocking down on your door to stuff a grenade up your ass really loads my diapy in a way that most other shooters don't do. And it's always a genuine joy to fight the replica forces. Honestly, fellas, if you enjoy some spooks and love shooting endless baddies in slow motion, then I really don't know how much more to explain that you should go play Fear. Because honestly, I don't think it has been topped in that regard, and not even by its own sequels. Yet, we're still not done with Fear, because there are two expansions developed by TimeGate Studios, those being Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate. And so we'll get into that, but first, there's kind of some weird canon stuff going on with them, so let's get into that for a little bit. Basically, for those that care, the expansions to the first Fear game are not considered canon by Monolith, and the Monolith games largely went in their own direction with the narrative that I'll get into in a moment. But if you are curious, this is is allegedly its own timeline, so yeah, whatever. Starting off with Extraction Point, it's pretty straightforward because it takes place after the events of the first game, with you still playing as Point Man and the primary objective is to get the hell out of Dodge while everything is going to shit, and I will immediately recommend that you play this one. Largely, it has to do with the fact that most of the aspects of the first game have been improved in some regard, ranging from the weapons, which adds in a little throwdown turret, a laser weapon, and a friggin' minigun we've all been begging for, as well as some more harrowing firefights to the backdrop of balls to the wall spooks. To start with the new weapons, they're all welcome additions to the roster of shish you use to give some mind-blowing information to a replica soldier. Beginning with a little turret that you can throw down like a grenade, it's very useful in some of the larger firefights this expansion is going to throw at you. And believe me, there's going to be some firefights that make you wonder how the hell computers back then could put up with all that is being handed out. Secondly, there's the two new actual guns that you equip, which come from freshly minted enemies from Armacam that give you a little taste of the medicine that you will dish out first before you get a hand on the weapons themselves. Which personally is a great diegetic way to be given new weapons instead of just finding them out and about on the floor like some sort of careless guy. 
The laser rifle is a decent addition that shoots out a constant beam of energy that will burn up all the foes to stand in your way. Personally, this one is not my favorite, not because it sucks, but because I thought it would have a more interesting effect on the replicas than just burning them. Because compared to the other energy weapon that liquefacts the soldiers to the bone, it seems kind of a little underwhelming. The new chain gun minigun, on the other hand, is a wonderful friggin' addition to the roster that just melts soldiers in your way to delightful glee. And then when you hit that slow-mo, it's something completely different with the way that it hits. So with that, let's get into a montage. Moving on to some of the spooks that Extraction Point is going to throw at you, it's to a different style than the first game, mainly that in the full game, it's a measure of subtlety, and then Extraction Point's horror elements throw that shit out the window and cranks that ludicrous up to 11. We'll have more vivid hallucinations and more scripted spooks that will break out into all-out havoc by having replica soldiers join the fray and you'll be having firefights while the psychic onslaught of what was wrought at the end of the main game fully comes to bear. And honestly, when it all clicks together and you're having these firefights while the world is ending in another regard, it's some of the most fun I've had in the horror FPS. But don't get me wrong fellas, I love my subtle spooks, but I also really enjoy the subtle spooks that eventually intensify into a balls to the wall ending sequence that has you fighting everything that you've dealt with and more and you almost have no clue on whatever the hell is going on because you're just worried about keeping your hide unskinned. Honestly fellas, Extraction Point is a perfect way to cap off the game, so when you're done the first main game, go right into Extraction Point because it's basically the main game but then on steroids. Sadly, I can't say the same for the other expansion which is Perseus Mandate because man oh man, I don't know if TimeGate Studios got dementia or something because man, they kind of just pooped themselves with this one. So you go, you open it up and you play it and you go, oh, mm, this one's a stinker. Ooh boy, Perseus Mandate. Man, this shit friggin' stinks. 
Perseus Mandate is the other expansion by Timegate Studios, and it legitimately baffles me that this was somehow the same team that developed the Extraction Point expansion, because it feels like you got someone who understands fear and what it does well and what it doesn't do well, then you give them a translabial lobotomy, followed by asking them to develop another great award-winning expansion, and after all that, all you got is a poor guy that the only thing he knows how to do is shit himself. So you're just kind of sitting there and shaking your head at the whole thing. To start this eulogy off, the expansion just looks cheap and terrible. It's as if you had to go to the dollar store and ask for some building textures and lighting and you couldn't even afford that. But the rest of this expansion is even more embarrassing than being broke and having to put the bottle of booze back on the shelf because you were too poor to buy it. Speaking of broke, remember when I said that Alma must be working for the developers because we never see AIs fighting against each other? While well, in Perseus Mandate, we find out the reason why, and that's because the AI has no friggin' clue on what to do when there's multiple of them on screen at the same time. Perseus Mandate also attempts to throw in new enemies known as Nightcrawlers or some stupid shit sh like that, that really, really don't add anything to the game at all. Whether it be the story, neither the visuals because they look like a bunch of friggin' goobers, and worst of all, they don't add anything when it comes to the gameplay. Unlike the replicas that have a lot of personality and are calling things out like actions or yelling expletives at the player when they shotgun or vaporize one of their own in magnificent slow-mo, the Nightcrawlers are deadpan and monotone in everything that they say or do. Narrative-wise, I barely even remember the events of the expansion because, for one, I almost never complete the expansion and only had done so long ago, so any footage that's in the inferior 16x9 is because of one, I couldn't record it in 21x9 because of issues, and two, because it was recorded by me ages and ages ago, when I still use that aspect ratio for my monitor. Now there is kind of one nice thing to say about Perseus Mandate and I didn't really get to experience it this time around before I got bored and dropped it, but there are some sections where they bring back some of the horror elements, but even here it seems to be phoned in. What I mean by that is that there's like jump scares and screamers, and they're not used like on the one end where they're used sparingly, and they're like a novelty, like in the main game, and then on the other hand, they're not used every other second like they are in say, Cry of Fear, where it doesn't even scare you anymore, and you just feel a never-ending adrenaline from all the shish that's going on, like you just get desensitized to all the screaming and jump scares. Basically, Perseus Mandate sits in the middle where the screamers are not a novelty because they are not used sparingly and they're not used enough where you get desensitized to them so you're just annoyed by them over and over and over again. So ultimately, you can tell that I absolutely do not recommend that you play through Perseus Mandate because I almost never ever make it to the good section. And if I won't even bother my time with this piece of trash, then neither should you. I have to say one last thing to keep it a little positive is that Perseus Mandate is a cool friggin name and it should have been used for something else entirely but I guess that caps off fear and its expansions. And once more to reiterate fellas, fear was such a good blast to go through as well as going through the expansions. Well, except for Perseus Mandate, but you know, whatever. So if you get the chance, I absolutely 100% recommend that you play through fear and extraction point and you can go and grab it yourself. But sadly, there's a few problems on how you can grab this game. So let's talk about that quickly. This is usually the part where I say, hey, you can grab this game for like $10 and it's frequently on sale, so go and do that. And it used to be that way for like 10 years ago for Fear and its expansions. But nowadays it seems that Monolith has done a really damn weird job with the games and how to buy them. So sadly, if you want to buy Fear and its expansions, you'll have to get the whole Fear collection, which is running at the moment for $54 Canadian or 54 euros, which as someone living in Italy is really friggin stupid. Just because we live here doesn't mean that we have to be paying a premium for these damn things. On top of having to have to pay the premium for all the damn games just to play the first one. So since you have to buy all of them in order to play the first one, let me drop my quick opinions on some of the other two monolith developed fear games, which are of course Fear 2, Project Origin, developed and released in 2009, in Fear 3 in 2011, but I pronounce it like Freer because it does that corny thing where instead of putting an E, it replaces it with a 3 for the fear. 
Fear 2 Project Origin I would say is a decent game in that the gunplay is decent and the enemies in the environments are pretty cool and there's some spooks to be had but generally the whole game does it at a level that is inferior to the first game. Only thing that it does better are the graphics which are noticeably better but the whole game has this damn brown or orange filter that a lot of the games from that era had that just kind of washes out the whole game and makes it look less interesting on the whole but I would still recommend it that you play, especially if you need to buy it anyways. Fear 2 is also weird that its expansion Reborn is like the first fear in its expansions where the only way to buy them is if you buy the whole collection. But the strange part is is that you can buy Fear 2 individually for like $14, which just doesn't make any goddamn sense. Now, moving on to Freer, this one is going to be a bit easy because I haven't played it at all. So I can't really recommend the game one way or the other, but I will say that I remember the reviews at the time saying that it was a horror co-op shooter that just didn't really do anything particularly well or necessarily bad either. It was just kind of mediocre, I would say, but as I've said, I haven't played the damn game, so I have no clue on whether it's good or not. These later Fear games I might do down the road, especially Fear 2 Project Origin because it does a lot of choices that were normal at the time but when taken with what Fear was known for it kind of dropped the ball on it and that might be really interesting to talk about. And there's also the ending to that game that is a wonderful bag of worms to get into for a deranged sex pervert like myself. Though if I were to have one thought on the series as a whole is that I wish they would have gone with a more anthology approach to the whole thing instead of it just being centered around Alma, Point Man, and Fettel. Imagine a fear where with every new entry there was another supernatural threat that the first encounter Assault Recon was dispatched to get rid of. You could be dealing with a containment breach of a US black site soldier's gene spliced with Area 51 aliens DNA to create a new line of astro bastards or foreign enemy remote viewing transdimensional weirdos that have you dealing with some messed up times shish. This could have been a whole lot different is what I'm saying and the idea is still really cool since the least developed part of fear well is fear itself and if they had more games to flesh them out that would have been really sweet. But another Monolith Productions game from this era I really want to talk about is Condemned Criminal Origins which is a wonderfully messed up horror shooter beat the hell out of drug addicts with pipe sort of horror game. There's honestly not that many games out there that make me genuinely feel like the sort of collapsing hell that Canada is heading towards more than Condemned because man, it does an incredible job of feeling like the world is ending but we never really know why. So look forward to that one one of these days but certainly not anytime soon. Well there you have it fellas, that's the end to my fear retrospective and man it was kind of a blast to go through. It was nice to pick up a game that I haven't played in a long time that I really really do enjoy and you know going back to it taking a look at it see what sticks and see what doesn't stick and man a lot of stuff sticks so it's pretty uh pretty nice to go through that game again it's also nice to get back into the retrospective format because it's different than my normal reviews or my impressions where with those ones i don't want to get into spoilers i don't really want to talk about the story and that one i just kind of want to leave it so you can get an impression on what i feel about the game and whether or not you should play it so with retrospectives, it's a lot more. I can be way more in depth with it. So to you, the audience out there, since this has been a thing I haven't done in a while, and to some people, it might be completely new that you haven't seen this one before. I really, really hope that um, you enjoyed it. And, you know, just let me know what you think. And please genuinely let me know what you think. That way I can tweak them in the future or maybe even drop them entirely. But as far as my plan is concerned, I really, really don't want to drop them because I really did enjoy the process of making this video again so with that please let me know down in the comments or shoot me a dm or whatever just let me know what you think anything to change or you know whether you if you really liked it just let me know because i really do wanna i want to make more of these because there's a lot more games that i really want to talk into in depth again instead of just doing your typical impressions and reviews so it's like i said these are gonna largely replace reviews but you know We'll see how it goes. So on top of all that, it was kind of wild to see the journey that Monolith Productions went through because I really, really do enjoy playing through blood and fear and no one lives forever. And even Shogo that maybe I might just do one of these days. And then they went to like the Middle Earth games, which like I said, are not quite my cup of tea. They're not bad, but just not quite my cup of tea. And now they're making a Wonder Woman game. And I just kind of, I don't really know what to think about that. So 
you know, hopefully one of these days the game will come out and we get to see for ourselves. And hopefully it's good because they're a really great, talented studio that deserves to have their success. But man, it's a part of me that just wishes they would still be making some horror games. And so with that, fellas, that is the total 100% end of the video. If you made it this far, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really do appreciate each and every single one of your views that make it this far. If you're a new fan, then hey, welcome to the show. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and you know, maybe you can go and look at my other videos and if you like those videos then maybe you should like and subscribe that would be pretty cool but with that fellas this is tom the chosen one going through a psychic wasteland trying not to get killed by a little girl and i'll see you guys next time take it easy